Shalom and welcome to another edition of Pearls of the Torah. I'm Moray Matan, Pastor Matt McEwen, and this week we are in the Torah portion called Bechukotai. This passage is Leviticus 26.3 through 27.34, and it concludes the book of Leviticus with a powerful set of blessings and curses tied to the Israelites' obedience or disobedience to God's commandments, as well as laws concerning vows. This portion emphasizes the covenantal relationship between God and Israel, illustrating the consequences of their choices and the importance of holiness. Tonight we're going to explore six key themes from Parashat Bechukotai, using traditional Jewish sources and, as always, providing a messianic insight for each. As we conclude a book of the Torah, each time we say, Chazak, Chazak, Vanit, Chazek, be strong, be strong, and let us be strengthened. As we get into this Torah portion, we first learn about blessings for obedience. I taught for our Havdalah service on Saturday from this Torah portion and talked about how our sages mention the physical blessings for following the Lord. You would think that in following the commands of God that we would get spiritual blessing over physical blessing. But in this Torah portion, we are specifically told of physical blessings, such as rain, for following the commands that God gives. So, from a traditional Jewish perspective, Leviticus 26 begins with promises of rain, agricultural abundance, peace, and divine presence if Israel follows God's laws. The Midrash in Vayikra Rabbah 35.1 interprets these blessings as not merely physical, but symbolic of spiritual and societal well-being. The rains not only come as a blessing because the crops will grow, but we are told by our sages that, well, I'll give you two different opinions. One is that the rains would fall at a convenient time for the Israelites. One opinion is that it would only rain on Friday night as Shabbat is coming in because people would not be going out and conducting business. So it's convenient that it is raining while they are in their homes celebrating the Shabbat. I find that very interesting. Another opinion is that on Wednesday nights, this was another night where people would not go out and conduct business, and so it rained on Wednesday night and Friday night. As always, we like to say, if you have two Jews, you have three opinions. So one of the fun parts of studying in a Jewish way is hearing the different opinions. So whether or not it was twice a week or once a week, the sages are in agreement that the rain not only fell for the benefit of the children of Israel, but it fell at a good time for them. As far as a messianic insight goes, from a messianic Jewish perspective, these blessings foreshadow the spiritual blessings in Yeshua. Ephesians 1.3 emphasizes that believers in Yeshua are blessed, are blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, reflecting the ultimate fulfillment of God's promises. We have to be careful about making everything overly spiritual. And we see this in this first point. There are physical blessings for following God's commands. And God blesses us in not just a spiritual way, but also He blesses us in physical ways. He gives us the opportunity to make a living, to provide for our families, 
to save money for the future, and to help us have enough supply to share with others. This is all part of his plan. Remember we've talked about before, there was a heresy in the early days of Christianity that said that the spirit was good, the spiritual aspect is good, but anything physical was bad or negative. This isn't just overly simplified, it's incorrect. It's not true. There are physical blessings in this world. And to ignore that, or to ignore the good that can be done in the physical, is to be inherently anti-Jewish. Because as I said last Saturday night, and as I've said previously, the commands that we follow for the Lord in this world must be done on the level of the physical. When we talk about the five layers or levels of the soul in Judaism, the level that interacts with this physical world and is able to do mitzvot is the level of nefesh. We must have this physical form, this physicality about us, in order to perform the good works in this world that God wants us to perform. It is a distinctly physical thing. To do a mitzvah is a physical thing. Spirits cannot perform a mitzvah in this world. It must be done on the physical level. So it's incorrect to say that the spiritual is good and the physical is bad. It's inherently anti-Jewish. But it also betrays a bias against the theology of the resurrection of the dead. In modern Christianity, in the last few hundred years, there has been an emphasis on what Christians call the rapture and a de-emphasizing of what is called the resurrection of the dead. When we focus on the rapture or the Christian belief of people being caught up into heaven before anything bad happens on the earth, at least in a pre-tribulation rapture scenario, what we are doing is saying that this world is bad and we need to get out of it. But it's not that this world is bad because it's physical. This world is fallen because of sin. And it is our job to help rectify that, to prepare the way for the Lord. We must remember that there is a king who is coming and he's bringing the saints, if you want to call them that, the righteous people with him that who have died in the past. And we are going to have physical bodies at the resurrection. We're told this in 1 Thessalonians and in other places, that we will have a body, a physical body, but it will be incorruptible. This is so important for our theology, because if we make it all about the spiritual, then we won't focus on trying to prepare this world or trying to protect this world, this God's creation, against damage and neglect or abuse. We have to be conscious of this. Point number two, curses for disobedience. So we saw blessings for obedience and now the opposite, curses for disobedience. From a traditional Jewish perspective, the detailed curses for disobedience serve as stern warnings about the dire consequences of turning away from God's commandments. The Talmud in Sanhedrin 98a discusses these curses in the context of national suffering and exile as a result of Israel's sins. Bad things do happen as a result of disobedience. Physical things that are bad happen as a result of disobedience. Look at the destruction of the second temple. We are told by our sages that it was destroyed because of something called sinat chinam, baseless hatred. Because of baseless hatred from one Jew to another, 
the temple was destroyed. Rabbi Shapira and many prominent rabbis in Israel will tell you that the only reason the October 7th Hamas attack was able to happen is because of this same disobedience to have Ahavat Yisrael, the love of one Jew for another. There was fighting, there was rioting, there was hatred between one type of Jew and another Jew, one uh, level of observance to another level of observance, or the secular against the religious. It was bad. And because of that, the defenses, spiritually and physically, were down. And this is why Hamas was able to attack. Please get Rabbi Shapira's book, The New Hamas, if you haven't already, and the companion book, the sequel, The Fall of Edom. It's explained brilliantly in there. We also see this on the date of the destruction of the temple. Because if you'll remember, it was on that date known as the ninth of the Hebrew month of Av, or as we say in Hebrew, Tisha B'Av. This was the date of the bad report that was brought back from the spies or the scouts that went out to scout out the promised land. Ten of them came back and gave a bad report and did not believe what God said about them being able to conquer. Only two, Joshua and Caleb, stood up for the truth of what God had said and told the people, we can take the land. Because of the bad report, there was this curse placed on this day, and many terrible things have happened on that day, which has now become a fast day and a day of mourning and introspection and repentance, many bad things happened on that day as a result of the disobedience of those spies. Not the least of which is the wilderness wandering that took 40 years. So there are sometimes direct physical consequences that happen as a result of sin. Now, as far as a messianic insight goes, Yeshua took upon himself all the curses in the law, in the Torah. We see this in Galatians 3.13. Now, as I teach in my courses, it's important that we remember when it says that we are freed or liberated from the curse of the law, it does not mean the law is a curse and so we're liberated from the law. That's not what it means. You see, the second set of tablets of the Ten Commandments were ratified by curses. The first set of tablets ratified by blood. We call it in the yeshiva as an easy way to explain this as Torah 1.0, the first set of tablets, and Torah 2.0, or the second set of tablets. Now, the second set of tablets, the second Torah 2.0, was ratified by these curses. Obey and you're blessed, disobey and you are cursed. What Yeshua does is takes away all the curses in the Torah, but not the blessings. This is why his laying down of his life is so important. He takes away the curses of the Torah, bearing the consequences of the sin on himself to offer redemption. The curses highlight the severity of sin and the depth of Yeshua's sacrifice, which restores the broken covenant relationship between humanity and God. And we always want to mission, mention, it is not a literal human sacrifice, which is forbidden in the Torah. What it is, is the concept of mesirut nefesh, which is the laying down of one's own life for others. Number three, the concept of teshuva, or repentance. Leviticus 26 verses 40 through 42 outline the power of confession and repentance, promising God's restoration if his people repent. 
This aligns with teachings in the Talmud so, uh, as far as Tractate Yoma 86a that stresses the importance of teshuva for atonement. This is something that we must do. Remember, the word shuv, which is there contained in the word teshuva, means to come back, to return, to be restored. This is important. In the modern church, I think we have come to look at repentance as apologizing, saying that we are sorry for what we did. But this is not teshuva. Teshuva is turning back and going back to God, a return, a restoration of the broken relationship. This is important. Remember when Yeshua gave the parable of the lost son or the prodigal son? It was not good enough for that son to simply feel badly for what he had done as he was sitting there with the pigs. It wasn't good enough for him to feel bad and regret for what he had done. It wasn't even good enough for him to have an apologetic mindset. He had to go back to his father. And that's what we must do. We have to go back to our father, almighty God. As far as a messianic insight goes, repentance is central to Yeshua's message. We see this in Mark 115. He provides the means for a deeper spiritual restoration, not just a return to the land, but a renewed heart and spirit, as we see in Ezekiel 36 verse 26, thus fulfilling the deeper intent of the Torah's call to repentance. Number four, the redemption of vowed property. Leviticus 27 discusses the laws regarding the redemption of property, persons, or animals dedicated to God through vows. The Mishnah Arachin 6a provides detailed discussions about how these vows can be redeemed. Yeshua's teachings and sacrifice reinterpret the concept of vows and redemption. He taught that true worship involves giving one's heart fully to God in Matthew chapter 5 verses 33 through 37. His death redeems us, a theme that fulfills the vow of giving oneself wholly to God, freeing us from the debt of sin. Number five, the sanctity of vows. The seriousness with which vows must be treated is emphasized through the stipulations for redeeming sacred objects. The famous Jewish commentator Rashi comments on Leviticus 27.9, explaining the importance of fulfilling vows made to God. We are told by not only Rashi, but many of our Jewish sages, that we must not make a rash or hasty vow to God. Yeshua says this in the New Testament. He emphasizes integrity in speech and commitment, teaching that one's yes should be yes and one's no should be no. In Matthew 5, 37, he fulfills all God's promises and vows, demonstrating the ultimate faithfulness required of God's covenant people. Let us not forget that one of Israel's own judges made a rash vow to God that when he returned from success, that he would offer up as a burnt offering whatever was to first greet him from his home, and it turned out not to be an animal that walked out, but his daughter. Let us not make rash vows. This is why there is a habit and a tradition in Judaism to use the phrase bli neder, or without a vow. In other words, to say, I'm not promising this, I'm not making a vow, but I will do my best to accomplish such and such. It is also common to say 
if the Lord wills it, then I will do it. Or to say, with God's help, I will do it. Last but not least, number six, the holiness of God's commandments. The entire portion of Bechukotai, with its stark depiction of blessings and curses, serves as a powerful reminder of the holiness of God and His commandments. It calls for a life lived in accordance with God's divine laws as a reflection of His holiness. Yeshua, in His life and teachings, not only upholds the Torah, but deepens its understanding in Matthew 5, 17 through 20, showing that true holiness is a matter of the heart and the spirit, not just external adherence. Remember, in our ministry, we are very big on standing against empty religion. God does not like religion. If your religious expression has the proper kavanah, or intention of the heart behind it, great. That is what we want. It is not empty ritual. We must mean what we do. We must allow our level of observance to match our level of understanding. Yeshua provides a means through which believers can live out the holiness of the Torah's commands empowered by the Holy Spirit, as we see in Romans chapter 8. Bechukotai challenges believers to consider the depth of their commitment to God's commandments and the consequences of their choices. From a Messianic Jewish perspective, this portion not only highlights the need for obedience and for holiness, but also appoints Yeshua as the ultimate means by which we achieve a restored and fulfilled relationship with God. Through Him, the intentions of the Torah are fulfilled, providing us the only true path to restoration and spiritual blessing. Thank you once again for joining me this week for Pearls of the Torah, and we are so happy to provide this teaching for you in many different languages now using this wonderful technology. Thank you so much for sharing this video and for your continued support of our ministry. I say to you, Shalom and Kol Tuv, all the best.